Namaste, everybody. This is your host of Tans Kumar, along with Ram and Nishant Limbachia. Today we have another exciting session of Indica Conversation. And in that, we have a webinar by Dr. Jeffrey Long. Jeffrey Long is, uh, he's going to present a webinar on misunderstanding Hindu Dharma. But before we do, here is a quick prayer. Ano bhadraha krato yantu vishwata. May auspicious thoughts come to us from all over the world. Now, a quick word about Indica. We are a non-traditional university for traditional knowledge. We seek to build a global renaissance based on Indic civilizational thought. We are pursuing a multi-dimensional strategy across time, space, and cause by establishing centers of excellence, transforming intellectuals, and building ecosystems. We are a 501c3 not-for-profit organization here in the US, and all contributions made to it are tax exempt. Please visit our website at www.indicacademy.org, explore and navigate our activities, platforms, and initiatives. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where we are at Indic Academy. A quick introduction to our speaker today, our presenter today, Dr. Jeffrey Long. Dr. Dr. Long is a professor of religion and Asian studies at Elizabethtown College, located in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, where he has taught since receiving his doctoral degree from the University of Chicago Divinity School in the year 2000. He's the author of A Vision for Hinduism, Jainism, and Introduction, and the Historical Dictionary of Hinduism, as well as co-editor of the Buddhism and Jainism volumes of Springer Encyclopedia of Indian Religions and editor of the volume Perspectives on Reincarnation, Hindu, Christian, and Scientific. Dr. Long is also the editor of the series Explorations in Indic Traditions, Ethical and Philosophical Theological sorry, <laughs> Indic Traditions, Ethical, Philosophical, and Theological for Lexington Books. In 2018, he received the Hindu American Foundation's Dharma Seva Award for his ongoing efforts to promote more accurate and sensitive portrayals of Hindu traditions in the American education system and popular media. He has spoken in a wide array of national and international venues, including meetings of the American Academy of Religion, university venues, including Berkeley, Princeton, Yale, and the University of Chicago, Vedanta societies and Hindu temples, and three times at the United Nations. His three upcoming books are Historical Dictionary of Hinduism, second edition published earlier this month, Hinduism in America, book coming up in September. Hinduism, Facts and Fictions, uh, upcoming book, date to be decide, decided. Uh, with that, I welcome you all to uh, our this session. And I will hand the floor to Dr. Long. If you have any questions, please hold on until the end of the session and please type it in the chat se section, and we will try to answer as many questions as the time permits. Okay, Dr. Long, over to you. Conversation facilitator may be then uh, an ultimate authority. Uh, I, I have a perspective, uh, everyone has their perspective, so I, I'm not necessarily expecting everyone to uh, agree with my analysis, but hopefully it will be a useful one for, for everyone to engage with. So who am I? Uh, so here's a picture of me from Holi from a few years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, just say that uh, uh, I have uh, been drawn to Hindu dharma, Hindu traditions, and uh, India and Asia more broadly for a very long time. Uh, I had a, 
Uh, probably the most traumatic event of my life happened uh, from the time I was 10 years old to about 12. Uh, my father was in a terrible accident. Uh, it left him quadriplegic. Uh, this was a big ordeal that our family faced. Uh, and uh, uh, he passed away uh, when I was 12 years old uh, after going through this, this really traumatic experience. And so this really prompted me to think very deeply about spiritual questions. Uh, what happens after we die, uh, if anything? Why is there suffering in the world? What is the purpose of all of this? Does it have a purpose? And I began looking very deeply at the world's religions and uh, philosophies. Uh, I grew up uh, in the Christian tradition and in the Roman Catholic faith. And I found many things in that tradition very reassuring and very helpful. But there were also things that I had questions about, and uh, there were some answers that I did not feel I was getting uh, there. And uh, to make a long story short, I ultimately found in the Bhagavad Gita uh, pretty much what I was looking for. Uh, there's uh, a longer story. I I've written and spoken about this a few times, but uh, I came across a copy of the Gita when I was 14, and uh, started reading it, and uh, that, that began a lifelong journey. So uh, for me, it has been both professional in terms of my job. I, I went into academia, became a professor in this field, basically so that I could immerse myself in the writings and the teachings and uh, the practices of Hindu traditions. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is what I've done. And it's also part of my personal, my spiritual life. Uh, I'm an, an initiated member of the Vedanta Society, the Ramakrishna tradition. In India, it's called the Ramakrishna Mission. And uh, I have a guru. Uh, I'm, I'm a practitioner, uh, as uh, my wife is as well. And uh, so this is a, a big part of our lives. Uh, not only, it's not only an academic uh, pursuit uh, for me, but it's also uh, my life. And so I'm, I'm very grateful to be part of this. And I consider myself a student uh, really perpetually. Uh, like I said, I've, I've hopefully learned a few things that I'll share with you today, uh, but uh, I, I'm still learning as well. And I look forward to learning from all of you. So what are some of the common misunderstandings of Hindu Dharma? Uh, there are a lot, uh, many more than we have time to discuss today. Uh, I have written in various places that uh, I think in America, at least, uh, the country where I've spent most of my life, uh, I think it's probably the most misunderstood of traditions. Uh, number one reason being people just don't know about it. Uh, there, there's just a lot of, of ignorance. Uh, people will confuse Hinduism with Buddhism. Um, for those of you who are Hindu, this will come as a big shock. People even confuse it with Islam. Uh, so that there's really very little knowledge of what is Hindu Dharma, uh, I would say just among the general population uh, in America. So there are a lot of misunderstandings, but uh, the common ones, the ones that, that we encounter a lot and that I think require some extra effort on the part of the Hindu community and uh, the allies of the Hindu community to to uh, combat are the following. Uh, of course, uh, we always encounter this charge of idol worship. Uh, you've probably all seen this uh, allegation made. This comes really from the Abrahamic traditions. Uh, if you look at uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, there is a strong prohibition on the use of images in worship and representing divinity in any kind of physical form. Um, this is a little bit relaxed in the Catholic tradition uh, that I grew up in, uh, and also the Eastern Orthodox tradition. They have icons and pictures, uh, but in Protestant Christianity, uh, in Islam, and in Judaism, you really see a, a prohibition of this. So the use of murtis uh, as an important part of worship, an important part of bhakti, is seen by many practitioners in those traditions as something uh, very negative, right? It, it's, it's something that you're not supposed to do. So it creates an immediate barrier to understanding. Um, it, it makes people a little bit resistant to wanting to hear about, well, what's, what's going on in, in Hindu traditions? What, what is the philosophy behind it? So you have to sort of get past that in various ways. And uh, it also feeds into another uh, question that comes up a lot of, about Hinduism. Is it polytheistic? Is it monotheistic? Is it pantheistic? 
these are not traditional Hindu terms. Um, the, in in uh, not just Hindu traditions, but if you look at Buddhism, if you look at Jain Dharma, uh, there's, this is not an issue, right? There, there's not really this question about one God versus many gods. This, this was very central to the self-awareness of the Abrahamic traditions as they emerged in the uh, ancient Near East and in uh, West Asia, uh, surrounded by societies that did use murtis, that right, did, did, did use imagery, and that called upon divinity through many names and many forms. And so Hindu dharma is very much like that. Uh, so uh, there is a sense in which you could say, well, this is polytheism, having many gods, which is, of course, a, a big no-no from an Abrahamic perspective. But then you also have an argument uh, that you'll often find, in fact, many Hindus will make, uh, that, well, no, it's really monotheism, because there is one supreme being who is manifesting in all the many forms that we see. So behind uh, Vishnu and Shiva and Shakti and Ganesha and all the deities, you have uh, the supreme Brahman, right? You have the infinite. And then, of course, there is the idea of uh, what is sometimes called pantheism, that is that God just is everything. And this is kind of like Advaita Vedanta. You know, you, you have the teaching uh, in the Upanishads, Sarvam Kavadam Brahma, all of this is Brahman. Uh, the idea that Brahman, the infinite, the supreme reality has become all things. Uh, at the same time, uh, you would not really say that uh, uh, all Hindu traditions are pantheist in this sense, because... Uh, there are traditions like Dvaita Vedanta, for example. Uh, there are the Bhakti traditions where there is a distinction affirmed between Bhagavan or Ishwara and us, the devotees, the jivas, the, the souls in the universe. So that doesn't seem to quite work for describing all of Hindu dharma. The closest thing I have found in, a, uh, in terms of a Western term that might accurately convey the Hindu understanding of divinity is uh, the idea of panentheism, which is a little different from pantheism. It's not that God simply is everything. It is the co-presence of divinity in all beings and of all beings in divinity. That is, we are all within the divine and the divine is within all of us. And this sort of transcends these ideas of polytheism, monotheism, and pantheism, because uh, it, it really kind of encompasses them all. Because uh, with panentheism, if you see divinity in all beings, then if you're looking at a variety of beings and seeing divinity in them, that's kind of like polytheism, right? You're seeing uh, God is here, God is there, God is in all of these. Uh, at the same time, there's a monotheistic dimension because this divinity we're describing is essentially one, according to the Upanishads, one alone without a second. And uh, it is in all beings, so there is a pantheist dimension to it. But it's also, there, there's a sense of distinction between the divinity and the beings in whom the divinity dwells. So panentheism is probably the closest thing you'll find to, uh, uh, I think, a fairly accurate understanding of uh, Hindu dharma. Uh, a nice illustration of the concept is in Bhagavad Gita, in the 30th verse of the sixth chapter, uh, Lord Krishna says, I am never lost to one who sees me everywhere and who sees all beings in me, and such a one is never lost to me. So this is panentheism. The divinity is within all beings, and all beings dwell within the divine. Now, as I've explained this, some of you might have also been deducing uh, uh, one of the reasons why Hindu dharma is often misunderstood in the Western world. And that's because a lot of these ideas are very sophisticated and uh, it's not as simple as, okay, tell me, are, is there one God? Are there many gods? Is there no God? What is it? it, it, it it's not so easily boiled down. It's very subtle and it really uh, has a lot of thought behind it. And so this requires some patience. So you can't put Hindu dharma on a bumper sticker or a t-shirt uh, so easily. Uh, it, it needs some thought and some understanding. So as a result of that, it, it's easily misunderstood. I see someone's written namaste uh, here across the screen. Namaste to you as well. Um, another common misunderstanding of Hindu dharma. Um, 
Varna and Jati. Uh, uh, I assume most of you have some familiarity with these terms. Uh, they are distinct from one another, but they have both been sort of conflated into the concept of what is today called caste. Uh, so essentially the idea that one is born into an occupation uh, and that this is hereditary and uh, really defines uh, throughout a person's lifetime um, what they can do and, and what they can be. And uh, this concept, uh, again, uh, it's really two concepts, Varna and Jati, uh, and the relationship between the two is complicated, uh, rather like what I was saying about divinity. This requires some, some thought and understanding in order to really unpack it. Uh, but the way it has been presented very often, especially in uh, textbooks, in school textbooks, is uh, it is as though Hindu dharma is nothing but this uh, social system uh, of caste. And there is, of course, so much more to Hindu dharma than that. Uh, and in fact, there, there are Hindu traditions that specifically reject the concept of jati as having any spiritual significance. The Gita says uh, a person of any jati uh, who has bhakti uh, comes to moksha, comes to, is liberated by Lord Krishna. And so uh, it's just irrelevant, right, uh, in terms of uh, what we might call a religious or spiritual system. And of course, uh, there are also a lot of Hindus for whom it's been extremely important. And uh, we should not deny that there are issues with the way it's practiced, things like untouchability. Uh, Swami Vivekananda was very critical of this. Uh, so was Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, so what is often presented, I think, is the idea that all Hindus simply believe and practice this system in a very straightforward way without any sense of self-critique or or understanding of you know, the various problems that can be associated with it. Uh, also, whatever positive elements it might have had, at least in ancient times, uh, are not really discussed. What you get is a picture of a very oppressive system. And it's the first thing a lot of people ask about. I had an experience of this a few years ago. I gave a presentation on Swami Vivekananda and his legacy in America, uh, which is a favorite topic of mine. It's something I've, I've written and talked about quite a lot. Uh, he had tremendous influence on a lot of popular culture, uh, a lot of intellectuals. A lot of people I consider my personal heroes uh, in the Western world were people who were very heavily influenced by Swamiji. And so I gave this talk about Vedanta and its influence in the Western world uh, at, at the college where I teach. And when it was over, I asked, okay, are there any questions? And there was only one question. And it was about caste, which I had not mentioned at all in the entire presentation. Uh, but it's what stuck in the mind of this student because that's how they were taught in high school. So this is a big issue uh, that really needs to be um, sort of approached in, in a very... A uh, sophisticated way that doesn't make it look as if we on the on the sort of you know side of, of the Hindu Dharma are trying to uh, defend or sweep under the rug or whitewash something that has had a lot of problems over the years, uh, but at the same time that uh, we emphasize that look there's so much more going on in Hindu Dharma there's so much profound thought so much uh, spiritual practice, so much wisdom, that if we only talk about this particular thing, uh, that uh, we have then discussed Hindu Dharma. This is just a very one piece of the whole picture, and, and it becomes greatly exaggerated, I think, in the Western world. Another uh, misunderstanding very often is of uh, Hindu pluralism. Uh, this uh, idea, uh, you see different terms for it in Sanskrit, dharma samandaya, which is often translated harmony of religions, uh, sarva dharma samabhava, having an attitude of equality toward all religions. Uh, this is one of the things that attracted me most to Hindu dharma early on in life. Uh, I, I grew up uh, hearing uh, preachers saying, you know, if you didn't accept Jesus, you were going to hell and non-Christians were going to hell. And I was Catholic and even Catholics were considered going to hell by some of these people. Everybody was going to hell. So uh, it, it, it just struck me as very hostile and very contrary to the whole idea of, of a loving God. And then I started uh, reading uh, 
things from uh, Sri Ramakrishna, from Swamiji, from Mahatma Gandhi, uh, various Hindu thinkers, talking about many rivers uh, flowing into the one ocean of the divine, many paths up the one mountaintop. And this just seemed much more logical to me. I, I, I tend to think of spirituality as kind of like a science. And so just as people from different cultures all over the world have independently discovered mathematics and some basic laws of physics and, and so on, uh, it would be the same way with spirituality, that, that uh, if uh, Brahman is everywhere and in all of us, that people would be discovering that around the world and then, of course, expressing it in their own way based on their culture and their understanding. So this made a lot of sense to me and, and uh, has always really attracted me. Uh, it does not mean all religions are the same. And this is unfortunately something that uh, a lot of Hindus who agree with the idea um, will often express it in this way. And I think it's an attempt to say it simply. Uh, again, it's an attempt to put it on a bumper sticker uh, or a t-shirt, but you can't really do that. Uh, this is a very sophisticated idea. It means religions are complementary paths to realization, distinct but capable of coexisting within a larger vision of reality. This is how Swami Vivekananda explained it. He said, they're not the same, they're different, but difference does not have to mean conflict. Difference can mean complementarity. And uh, a nice image for this is given by a teacher in the Vedanta tradition, uh, Pravajika Vrajaprana. Uh, she's written a wonderful, uh, simple introduction to Vedanta where she explains harmony of religions as being uh, sort of like this. She says, uh, the religions are like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And if you've ever, ever put together a jigsaw puzzle, the pieces are different. They're, they aren't the same. Uh, but they fit together to form a larger picture. And you can look at the great traditions of the world, not only the religions, but you look at science, you look at different philosophies. They all capture some piece of truth, but they don't necessarily capture the same piece. And to really understand reality, we need to be attentive to all of them. And uh, this has been understood, uh, I think, in India for many, many centuries. And this is why so many traditions were able to coexist peacefully in India for such a long time. Uh, and of course, probably the most famous image for this is that uh, I'm showing here, uh, the blind men and the elephant, right? The very famous story where you have a group of blind men they're presented with an elephant and they're asked to describe it. So they can't see. So each of them feels the elephant and they each grasp a different part of the elephant and they begin to describe what they're grasping. And of course, because they're grasping different parts, they describe different things, right? The, the description of the man grasping the trunk is going to be different from that of the man feeling the leg or the man feeling the ear or the tusk or the side of the elephant or the man in back grasping the tail. So they start to argue with one another about their various descriptions, like, no, it's not like that, because it's different from what they've experienced. But the reality, of course, is that the elephant is all of these things, right? So in the same way, reality is vast, it's complex, and it contains many dimensions. And if you look at most of the spiritual traditions in the world, they tend to focus on one or another of these aspects of reality. So this is a, a view that's often misunderstood. The, people are taken as saying, oh, religions are all the same. And since that's very obviously not true, then you'll have people say, well, then Hindus don't know what they're talking about or they're irrational or you know, something like that. So we have to explain this idea in a way that captures its full meaning. What are some other common issues? Uh, there are stereotypes uh, associated uh, with Hinduism. Uh, you've probably all heard this phrase, caste, cows, and curry. I, I believe Rajiv Mahotra uh, coined this term. Uh, it, it captures very nicely uh, the sort of picture that a lot of people in the Western world especially get when they think of Hinduism and Hindu traditions. Of course, there's the excessive emphasis on caste, um, the sanctity of all life, not only the cow, but you know, the fact that there are free range cows in India in, in urban areas, you know, that's very fascinating to people in the West because we don't tend to see it here. Uh, you know, it just, uh, this idea of something that's very exotic uh, is often how people think. And some people might find that appealing, but it also is a way of, of uh, sometimes subtly, sometimes not so subtly belittling uh, the tradition. So uh, it is problematic. Uh, politics in the media, uh, this is a, a big issue right now. I, am, I know uh, probably a lot of you are active on social media and I see a lot of commentary that uh, 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 people in the Hindu community make on you know, news stories coming out of India and so on. 
And uh, the media tends to focus on things that are sensational. Uh, so especially if you have a story where Hindus are engaging in behavior that's intolerant or, or violent, you'll see that in the media. And the problem coming from a Western country like the United States is this. Um, let's suppose you're in America and you see a story in the media about Christians behaving intolerantly or violently. And you do see those stories. They're, the stories are there. But if you're living in America where more than 80% of people are Christian, uh, you'll see that story and the average American will say, okay, yeah, that, that's terrible, but I know Christians, I have Christian friends, and of course they're not all like that. That doesn't reflect the tradition at its best. And so, you know, that's an unfortunate thing that happened, but you, you just kind of move on and you, you contextualize it. But in a country where Hindus are less than 1% of the population, most people will not know uh, someone who's Hindu. They won't have a lot of Hindu friends. And all they will hear will be this very negative story. And so they don't have that context that enables them to see where that story fits into a larger uh, understanding of, of what's happening uh, in India. And so lacking that background, uh, people just get a, a very, very negative picture. And the same thing happens in other societies. Uh, my wife teaches Japanese, and so we have a lot of Japanese friends. We, we go to Japan fairly frequently. And there are people in Japan who think that people in America are just shooting each other all the time uh, because you have all these horrible stories about school shootings. And yes, they're horrible. There, there should, you know, we, we can hope that there'll never be another one. But if you live in America, you know that that's not daily life in America. We're not all shooting each other all the time. Uh, most of us have not been uh, in a shooting, uh, haven't had any experience like that. So in the same way, people in America will look at news from India and they'll just think it's one communal riot after another. And uh, I've lived in India and I just, I know that's not the case. So uh, this is a problem. Uh, and, and of course, politics, of course, plays a role in this as well, because uh, you know, particular uh, groups are trying to present their particular spin on what's happening, what's going on. And so all of this can create a picture that's very distorting uh, of India as a whole. And then, of course, of Hindu, Hinduism in particular, because Hinduism is so closely connected with India, right? Most Hindus live in India and uh, most Indians are Hindu. So uh, the image of India uh, abroad becomes the Indi image of Hinduism as well. Uh, what are the reasons uh, for some of these misunderstanding? Uh, there is uh, what I'm going to call popular Hindu phobia. That is Hindu phobia on the part of just the average person uh, in the Western world, especially. And then there is this phenomenon that uh, uh, there's been a lot of writing on in recent years of academic Hindu phobia. Uh, and that plays a role as well because those of us who are professors, those of us who write about and have expertise uh, in Hindu traditions, we're the people that, uh, that the lar larger population looks to for knowledge. And so uh, if there is Hindu phobia amongst us, then that's also going to have a big impact on, on, how, on the attitudes people have in the larger society. So I just want to quickly go through some of this. Uh, popular Hindu phobia, a lot of this comes from ethnocentrism. Uh, ethnocentrism, this is sort of an anthropological term. A sociological term. It's a phenomenon we find in all societies, right? Everybody judges the world around them in terms of the society and the group that they are part of and that they identify with. And so no one's exempt. Uh, I've seen ethnocentrism when I uh, traveled in India. Uh, people thought a lot of things about me because I was an American and 90% of them were not true, <laughs> but they came from television and movies and perceptions that people had. Um, I found that's decreased over the years because uh, there's so much more contact now between India and the US. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of ethnocentrism, and uh, America is certainly not exempt from ethnocentrism, far from it. Uh, then you have uh, beyond ethnocentrism, which is sort of a more generalized tendency to judge others based on 
one's own understanding of reality. You have more overt religious bigotry as well. Uh, there is a long history of Christian missionary engagement with India and attempts to convert Hindus to Christianity. And uh, America is a very diverse country, but there are uh, still very, very conservative Christians in America who believe that it's their duty to convert the rest of the world. And so their encounter with uh, Hinduism is going to be one in which the assumption from the beginning is that Hinduism is something wrong, it's something demonic, uh, it's idol worship, etc. And so uh, there's going to be a, a desire to attack it, to debunk it, to present it in a negative light. And those organizations are very much alive and, and uh, some of them are quite wealthy and, and quite persistent. I uh, edited a document for the Hindu American Foundation. Oh, it's been more than 10 years ago now, but it, it's called uh, Hyperlink to Hindu Phobia. I don't know if it's still on their website, but it's about hate speech against Hindus uh, on the internet. And the vast majority of these were religious in nature. They, they, a lot of them came from Christian missionary organizations uh, that were attempting to portray Hinduism in a negative light. Now, of course, not all Christians are you know, so uh, bigoted and uh, a lot of very open-minded Christians who are very deeply and seriously engaged with, with uh, Hindu spirituality. But uh, this bigotry is uh, still a big factor. And uh, it's uh, something that uh, fuels, I think, a lot of, of Hindu phobia uh, in the popular Hindu phobia in the Western world. And then, uh, of course, to the extent that Hindus and, and Hinduism uh, and Hindu dharma are identified with India, um, you have uh, Indophobia, I would call it, uh, that, that shades over into Hinduphobia, uh, which is basically a species of racism, right? This is also something that unfortunately is still with us in the 20th century, 21st century. Uh, and uh, there is... Uh, you know, th there's a tendency to, uh, and this is kind of an extension of ethnocentrism, look down on other cultures, other civilizations, and uh, kind of connecting with the popular media stories, right? Anything negative about India, uh, you know, it, it, people will often try to look at negative information about another society as a way of reassuring themselves about their own society. Someone will see very troubling figures uh, in America about violence or hate speech or violence against women, for example. And so one response is to say, well, at least we're not in India, right? So you know, to, to sort of think, oh, well, we're, you know, we're somehow better in the Western world. And of course, this will affect how people think of Hindu Dharma because uh, Hindu Dharma is the, the dominant tradition in, in India. And so anything negative about India, there's a tendency to blame Hindu dharma. Uh, one of the books that Avatanji mentioned that I'm working on right now, uh, the Hinduism facts and fictions is getting into a lot of these uh, stereotypes and, and misunderstandings. And uh, uh, one of them that you'll sometimes come across is uh, blaming Hindu dharma for the poverty that's present in India. And, uh, the, there, there was recently a study done by an Indian economist, which revealed that if you translate it into today's dollar values, US dollars, when the British ruled India, they extracted $45 trillion worth of wealth from India. Uh, think of what India could do today with $45 trillion, right? Uh, forget coronavirus, right? That, that would have been uh, cured a long time ago, right? There, the, everything would have been fixed. Uh, things would have been much better. Um, it takes a country and a civilization a long time to recover from colonialism. So this is a, a, a big issue. And there is a blame the victim mentality very often. It's like, oh, why is there poverty in India? Well, it's because of the caste system and Hinduism. And so you hear these kinds of things said. And of course, this gets us into neo-colonialism, right? Uh, uh, there's global politics at play here as well. And uh, the United States has, uh, uh, has been a dominant country for a long time in the world and uh, does not want rivals, right? So uh, you do have a tendency of... Uh, not only with India, but a lot of countries where the U.S. will sort of try to put down uh, those countries in various ways. So all of these uh, and attitudes uh, uh, are sort of holdovers from the colonial period and from a period when, when uh, racism was an even more powerful force in world affairs. It still hasn't gone away. And you see this in sort of popular attitudes toward Hinduism and uh, Hindu dharma and uh, uh, Hindu traditions. 
I do want to say though, when I when I mentioned popular Hindu phobia, it's not that most Americans are sitting around talking about how terrible Hindu traditions and India is all the time. Most Americans are just not aware of it at all, right? Again, there's that there's that uh, sort of elephant in the room. We always have to understand that you know, like the average American doesn't even know what we're talking about here. Uh, but to the extent that they might have had heard something about India or about Hindus, it's often going to be negative, and it's going to be because of these factors I've just been describing. So that's on the popular level. Now, what about people who should know better, right? What about uh, academic Hindu phobia? So I wrote an article about this a couple years ago, and I'm really just going to kind of recap here what I said there. Um, first of all, uh, we need to differentiate between Hindu phobia and constructive criticism. So someone might write something about, let's say, untouchability, right, or abuses that happen because of belief about untouchability, for example. That is not necessarily a Hindu phobic piece of writing. It might be intended to solve that particular problem. And in fact, uh, Hindus are sometimes the very best uh, critics of Hindu dharma uh, in practice, right? Not dharma as an ideal, but uh, the abuses that happen in practice, right? You have all, all these great reformers like uh, like Swamiji, like uh, Ramohan Roy, and even going all the way back, you know, to Shankaracharya. And so they, they were all uh, trying to get people to live in a way that lived up to the ideal of Hindu dharma. And so uh, criticism is not always Hindu phobia. And this is important because especially if we become very sensitive, which we should be to Hindu phobia, and we want to counter it when we encounter, when whenever we, we want to counter it whenever we encounter it. Uh, at the same time, it, it, it doesn't mean that everything that's negative that might be said is Hindu phobic. Some criticisms are genuine and we need to say, okay, maybe there's something here that needs to be addressed. Um, and the test that I sort of came up with, and this was from my own conversations with some people that I thought were very Hindu phobic, um, I realized at a certain point that there was nothing that Hindus could possibly say or do that would satisfy these people, right? So this is the Hindu phobia test. Is there any way Hindus could respond to the criticism apart from renouncing Hinduism altogether that would satisfy the critic? So if the answer is yes, then this is a genuine criticism. In other words, if a Hindu could possibly say, well, that particular practice is not actually warranted in our shastras and in, in the, the shruti and smriti. It's, it's not a proper Hindu practice. Or if the Hindu would say, yes, I agree with you, uh, that practice has no, no part in, in Hindu dharma. We, we need to work to change that. Uh, then if the person is genuine, then they will say, okay, great. You know, let's, let's work together for a better world. But if the person is just carping about Hindu traditions, right? They just don't like Hindu traditions. Nothing you say is going to satisfy them. And uh, I, I've had this experience, unfortunately, which is how I came up with this test, because I was having an interaction with a couple people who were very anti-Hindu, and they were saying, well, you know, you're, you're so drawn to, to Hindu traditions, but what about this? What about that? What about this? And I had answers for all of them. And, I, and, and uh, some of my answers were, well, no, you've misunderstood that. And some of my answers were, yes, you're right. That's a problem. And, and it's something we need to work on. And uh, it, it doesn't reflect uh, authentically what's there in, in the uh, original teachings. But that didn't seem to matter uh, to these folks, right? They, they just were determined to tear down uh, Hindu tradition. So uh, this is the what I call the Hindu phobia test. If you encounter a criticism and you want to know, if, is this legitimate criticism, uh, constructive criticism, or is this just Hindu bashing? Uh, that's the question to ask, right? Uh, is there a way that I could answer this that would the, the person who's saying it would say, oh, okay, I understand now, or okay, we're, we're in agreement on this, or would it necessarily be the case that they would just keep on bashing, right? So uh, this, I think, is very important. Sometimes Hindu phobia is only apparent. Uh, I call it sometimes tone deafness. Uh, there is writing about Hindu traditions that comes from particular disciplines where the authors write in such a way that if you're used to Hindu phenomena being treated reverently, treated uh, as as a source of spiritual insight and wisdom, right? If, if you're thinking about the kind of reading you might want to do 
uh, and discuss in, in a satsang or something. Some of the academic writing on Hindu phobia is just, or on, on, uh, uh, on Hindu traditions is just not like that, right? Uh, in my article, I said there, there are writings on Hindu traditions that make it sound as if the author is describing a new species of bacteria that they've discovered, right? It's, it's very clinical and detached. That's actually not Hindu phobic. That's, that's an attempt at writing in a detached and an objective way. Uh, and a lot of scholars uh, of Hindu traditions have been taught that that's how you write about it. And sometimes the people who write that way are practicing Hindus themselves, right? And they're, they're not intending any disrespect. So this is a situation where one needs to say, okay, who's the author? Who's the audience? Why are they writing this? And the sociological text is, for example, is not something you're going to uh, be discussing it at a satsang, right? It, it's, uh, it's got a different purpose. So it's not going to be written in the same sort of very beautiful way. Uh, so I, I call that apparent Hindu phobia in my article. Uh, then there is what I call the Hindu phobic discourse. Now here's where things start getting more problematic. Uh, the Hindu dis uh, discourse, Hindu phobic discourse, uh, I call it in my slide here, I call it a self-replicating meme. That is, there are ways of talking and thinking about Hindu traditions that have become so established in the academic institutions that it's as if they've taken on a life of their own, right? Sometimes when we talk about Hindu phobia, it almost sounds like there's a conspiracy theory. Like we're, we're thinking that a bunch of academics got together and thought, okay, how can we, how can we tear down uh, Hindu traditions? Uh, there may be people thinking that way, but I, I've never been involved in any such conversation. But what I do find is that certain writings become authoritative, they become established, and becomes a matter of habit. Uh, you could call this a collective sanskar, right? So writing about caste in a particular way, for example, uh, writing about uh, you know, Hindu national movements in a particular way. Uh, this becomes a, a sort of a habit. And so it could be that someone who may who themselves, an author may not feel. Hindu phobia, right? They might, they might not feel any aversion or negativity toward Hindu dharma at all, but they might write in a way that replicates some of these very negative uh, misunderstandings that we've talked about, not out of malice, but because they, that's just how they've been taught, right? That's what their, their professors have taught them. That's how they've understood it. And it hasn't been corrected uh, yet in their minds. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I mean, I, I see myself as, you know, very much about promoting this tradition. And, and uh, in some of my own earlier writing about Vedanta, I used to use this term Neo-Vedanta, which you might have seen before. Uh, and my understanding at the time was that that was simply the term we use for recent writing about Vedanta, right? So things that come from the 19th century to the present, right? Swamiji's writings, uh, Sarvapali Radhakrishnan, people like that, that this was Neo-Vedanta, right? And only gradually did I begin to understand that this is actually a very negative term. It's a pejorative term that was developed by an Indologist named Paul Hawker, uh, who was also a very hardcore Christian um, apologist, right? Uh, missionary uh, sort of mentality. And he wanted to discredit Swami Vivekananda and the contemporary Vedanta movement by saying that this was not authentic Hinduism. It's different from Hindu Dharma as practiced uh, traditionally in India. And so he coined this term Neo-Vedanta to sort of say, well, there's real Vedanta and then there's this Neo uh, business. Well, when I realized that, I immediately stopped using that term. Uh, and I was sensitized to this by swamis in the tradition in which I practice, right? The, uh, the monks in the Ramakrishna order, we were having conversations and uh, some of the swamis brought my attention to the fact, you know, yeah, this term Neo Vedanta is not such a good way to talk about it. And there have been other uh, terms used, integral Vedanta, um, a good friend of mine, Swami Medhananda, uh, has uh, coined this term Vigyana Vedanta, drawing it from the teaching of Sri Ramakrishna. Um, but when I was using that term, I was not trying to denigrate the tradition. It was just that was the term I'd learned. So that's what I mean by Hindu phobic discourse as a self replicating meme. A discourse is something that you engage in. Uh, possibly without full awareness of its implications and its origins. Uh, it's like you learn a language and you just, you use the words that you learn in that language and, and they have particular meanings and connotations that you did not manufacture, but you replicate those by using those terms. So the discourse is something that we have to really sort of get at. When we locate 
elements of the Hindu, Hindu phobic discourse, we need to point them out and correct them or contextualize them. Um, I find that there are different varieties of Hindu phobic discourse. And what I've seen is that in a very interesting way, these map onto the purusharthas, uh, that is the human goals as defined in Hindu dharma. And uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the purusharthas, dharma, artha, kama, moksha. And this idea of purusharthas, these four things that we all aspire for in life, uh, this is something uh, that's actually inspired a lot of Western thinkers. Uh, the, one, the one I have in mind right now is the psychologist Abraham Maslow. Some of you might have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And he talks about how in human psychological development, we have to fulfill certain needs before we can move on to the next one. So most basic is food and shelter, safety, security. And then you gradually move up a ladder. And the final one he calls self-actualization, right? So uh, we sort of move through these different phases of life. And what I find is the different types of Hindu, Hindu phobic discourse seem to reflect where, where certain authors are in terms of their, their main focus, right? Each of these Purusharthas, at a different level of spiritual development, it's going to become the central focus of life for a person at that phase, right? And so you can see this manifesting in Hindu phobic writing in a very interesting way. So if we look at dharma, um, is there Hindu phobic writing that reflects sort of the person being at the level of where, where they're focused primarily on dharma? And I would identify in terms of Hindu phobic discourse, I would identify this with interreligious apologetics. For example, Christian missionaries criticizing Hindu dharma on its own terms in order to refute it, right? So it's still Hindu phobic writing, but when I say it's on the level of dharma, what I mean is the Christians have a different vision of dharma and they're trying to advance that against the Hindu vision of dharma. And they are, as I say, they're criticizing Hindu dharma on its own terms. So let me give you an example. Um, uh, one of the topics that is most, one of the things that's most drawn me to Hindu dharma, and Avatansji mentioned a book that I had edited about this topic, uh, Rebirth or Reincarnation. Uh, rebirth is, a, is an idea that has really attracted me. I find that it makes a lot of sense. And I also think there's a certain body of evidence growing for the phenomenon of rebirth. Now, uh, someone who disagrees with the idea of rebirth, let's say coming from, for example, uh, a Christian perspective, they'll try to find inconsistencies with the idea of rebirth and try to advance a Christian vision of the afterlife as an alternative. So that's engaging at the level of dharma. It's still you know, against Hindu dharma, but it is taking it seriously on its own terms. That's very different from the next two. Um, at the level of artha, this would be seeing Hindu dharma solely in terms of wealth and power, uh, issues connected with wealth and power. An example of this would be Marxist criticism of Hindu dharma. So this does not take Hindu dharma seriously on its own terms. It would view ideas like rebirth as being there to advance some power agenda. So someone coming from the perspective of Artha would see rebirth as a way to argue, well, the reason you have caste is because people are reborn in a certain station because they deserve it because of their karma, and therefore they deserve to be oppressed by us who have good karma and so on, and ignoring anything like you know the evidence for rebirth or moral arguments and so on. So uh, that would be an example of, of, of a Hindu phobia coming from the level of Artha. Now, I mentioned Marxist criticism here as an example. Uh, Marxist criticism actually has a lot of uh, interesting and useful dimensions to it. Uh, the problem is not with Marxist criticism per se, it's with seeing Hindu dharma solely in terms of wealth and power issues, right? A Marxist criticism could be a piece of a larger understanding of how a society works. But the problem is with, with reducing right, everything just to artha, everything just to wealth and power. And this is uh, a type of Hindu phobia that we see. And then, of course, kama, uh, seeing Hindu dharma solely in terms of the sensory impulses. So Freudian analysis is the one that leaps out at us here, right? Seeing sexuality in everything, for example. Uh, again, 
this doesn't mean there's anything wrong with sexuality or seeing sexuality, but if everything is sexuality, then you're losing most of the reality, right? So uh, you have authors arguing from a perspective of, you know, their, their focus is, is dharma, right? They're engaging the tradition on its own terms, maybe negatively, but at least on its own terms. Then you have the artha perspective that sees everything as a manipulation intended to advance one's power and wealth. And then you have uh, the Kama perspective, which sees everything in terms of, of the senses. And then, of course, the, uh, as I just said, uh, the problem is not the forms of analysis, but their reductionism. And the reason we see a lot of reductionism in the academy is because uh, in the academy, we're trained to be skeptical, right? We're trained to question everything. And very often, this will lead to an attitude of, of atheism and of, uh, you know, uh, oh, everyone's just in everything for their own power or everything, everyone's just into everything for their own pleasure. And so a tendency to be dismissive of claims about the spiritual, claims about morality, claims about higher reality, and so on. So that's where you get a lot of reductionism uh, at that artha and kama level. Of course, then the fourth Purushartha is moksha. I would say at this stage, all phobias vanish, right? If you have an author who is an aspirant for moksha, <laughs> they're not afraid of anything. They're, they're there to seek truth. And there's, you know, we're not talking about Hindu phobia then uh, when we're talking about uh, moksha. So that's, that's my presentation. There's a lot more that I could have said, but uh, you all are busy and have things to do and we have a lot of questions. So I now hand the program back to uh, uh, our leaders here and uh, we'll see what questions people have. Well, thank you, Dr. Long. It was a wonderful presentation and uh, uh, we learned a lot. Uh, but before we open up uh, the floor for questions, can you briefly talk about some of the, the, the three books that those are coming out? And... Oh, okay, sure. So um, the Historical Dictionary of Hinduism is... Um, uh, a second edition, expanded and updated, of a book that I published in 2011. And it just came out the, this month. In fact, the tragedy is it just came out as we all got locked down for coronavirus. So <laughs> <laughs> I can't go out hawking my book. Uh, one thing about that book I will say is that if you look it up on Amazon.com, it's horribly expensive. Uh, get a copy from your library. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's the kind of book that universities and libraries will purchase uh, it's a reference work. But uh, I have uh, had a lot of people tell me through the years that the first edition was useful and the new edition's even bigger and has more in it. And, and I've also corrected a few embarrassing mistakes that I found in the first one, uh, typos and whatnot. So uh, hopefully it's a book that people will find useful as a reference. Uh, the second one that's coming in September is called Hinduism in America. Uh, the subtitle is A Convergence of Worlds. And uh, it's really been a labor of love. Uh, I, uh, I grew up in America and was drawn to Hindu Dharma. And um, I've, I've been very interested in chronicling the history and sort of talking about the broader uh, influences within American culture of, uh, of Hinduism in America. And um, one book that really inspired me a lot was Philip Goldberg's uh, American Veda. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with that. But I wanted to go beyond that. Uh, I, I, the subtitle I give, A Convergence of Worlds, is uh, I'm not only talking about Westerners, people like me who are drawn to Hindu traditions, but I also wanted to talk about the immigrant community, the Hindus who've come to America and are keeping the tradition alive and are developing it in new ways in this new context. And so uh, I wanted to bring those stories together because those stories are coming together, right? The, the, the gap between what you might call the Western seeker and the heritage practitioner is less than it used to be. I mean, you all have me on here now talking about Hindu Dharma, right? So uh, that's just an example. Uh, and so a convergence of worlds, right? These are coming together more and more. And uh, so that book is coming uh, from Bloomsbury um, and it will be in paperback and it will be affordable. So I'm very happy about that. Uh, the other one, Hinduism, Facts and Fictions. Uh, first, I'll, I'll just admit right away, I'm embarrassed at how overdue it is. I signed the contract years ago, but uh, it's finally coming together. And I just have to tell you that uh, you're inviting me uh, here today has actually been helpful in the process of, of writing that book because 
what I've done today is basically a summary of what of what that book is doing, uh, getting into some of the stereotypes and uh, false views about Hindu dharma, and also uh, I would say even more often half truths. Right, so uh, a lot of the negative views about Hindu dharma are not purely manufactured, but they're based on taking you know one piece of the story and focusing only on that. So contextualizing a thing, things like caste, for example, what's the context for understanding that really in a balanced way. So uh, that book I, is supposed to come out by the end of this year, uh, but it's, I, I have to finish it <laughs> and turn in the manuscript. So uh, coming, coming soon to a bookstore near you. Yeah, great, great. So we'll be in touch with you about these books too. And we will, uh, as Indic Academy, we'll love to have book launches and conversation about it in future whenever it comes out. Okay, wonderful. A um, couple of questions that I have. Uh, before I do that, one, uh, the article that you were talking about, Hindu phobia, it's uh, available on Academia, your yes. Academia site, and it's called um, uh, from the Hindu phobia and the practice, something like that, just, yes. Uh, from the perspective of yeah. a scholar practitioner. Practitioner, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so published people can. Pra pra first published in Prabuddha Bharata, uh, mm -hmm. the Journal of the Ramakrishna Order. Right, right. okay. So that, that's available online, so people can uh, refer to it, because that gives a very good framework for some of the things that you were talking about. Yeah. Um, other question is, the, some of the misconceptions or stereotypes or Hindu phobia that come, uh, it comes from what Professor uh, Arvind Sharma once wrote uh, is uh, from what he calls from outsider to outsider. So people started writing about the uh, indigenous cultures during the colonial period and uh, what came out from them from what they perceived to be the uh, tradition became uh, frozen. And then to the extent that the native perception almost vanished, at least in the academic circle, yeah. right? So how do we reconcile now that colonialism is over and we live in a world which is more open and more connected, how do we reconcile those uh, those outsider idea from the practitioners like Swamiji's, you know, they have become totally irrelevant in academic circle. Wow. Okay. Uh, oh no, I, I think uh, you're right about that. And what's needed is um, really a, a very vigorous dialogue in which academic scholars who are both, both insiders and outsiders uh, to the tradition who are in the academy and representatives uh, of the community, people like the Swamiji's, for example, need to be very closely engaged with one another and listen to one another. So this means uh, both the academic, on the academic side, not simply learning the theories and perspectives that we got from our professors in graduate school, but also being very open to the, you could say the indigenous perspectives, the perspectives of uh, practitioners with whom we are engaged. And at the same time, and this is something, of course I'm biased, but I'm gonna brag about our Swamis in the Ramakrishna mission a little bit. Uh, the Swamis also becoming very engaged with the academic discourse. And uh, I would say we have, we have some Swamis who've been very, very good at that. And they can speak the language of theory and talk and write in a sophisticated way that the academic audience will say, oh, okay, that is, you know, that is, that, that's legitimate, right? And then that will, I think, help to bridge that gap a bit. That, now, that's not going to be the only solution because there are all kinds of political constraints pulling people away from each other, right? Uh, internal to both, you know, sides. I mean, I hate to even think of these as sides, but, but it's true. Uh, so, um, and again, you also have these sort of, like you said, the self, the self-replicating nature of the discourse I was talking about earlier. Um, at the the first place where I met the Swami, who is my guru, uh, was at an academic conference, and he and several other Swamis were presenting there, along with professors. And again, someone like myself, who I mean, I I would consider that I've always been very open to the tradition and learning from the tradition. I went to that conference with the assumption 
that the really interesting papers were going to be given by the academic scholars and that the Swamis would probably say a prayer and do a blessing and say a few nice things about what a great man Swami Vivekananda was. Uh, Swami Vivekananda was the topic of the conference. And that would be that. The Swami's papers were by far the best papers at the conference, not only from a practitioner perspective, but from an academic perspective, right? They were very learned papers and a very impressive work. And, uh, you know, I was, I was just pulled in uh, by that. Um, the academic papers, I mean, they weren't bad. I mean, I, I gave one of the academic papers. I, I, I thought it was okay, but you know, they, they weren't as exciting, uh, uh, frankly. Uh, but more of this kind of uh, conversation where we bring together practitioners and scholars in a, in a friendly way, but also in a frank way, right? Uh, we, we want to avoid, I think, two extremes. Uh, you have the occasions when scholars and practitioners come together and you have a shouting match. And I've, I've been witness to a couple of those. Uh, they're very unpleasant for everyone involved uh, and very counterproductive. On the other hand, you have the occasions when people come together and they really don't talk about anything controversial and everyone smiles and, you know, and we feel we've made a great advance for world peace. Uh, but in fact, you know, not much has happened. So frank but friendly conversation, bringing together respected leaders in the community with re respected academics uh, who are open to this kind of conversation. And I think the other thing I want to mention too is when, when we talk about academic Hindu phobia, I don't want to give the sense that it's all pervasive. There are wonderful scholars writing uh, great things about Hindu dharma. Uh, the thing is, uh, uh, there's been a lot of focus on what I would call the sexy stuff, uh, you know, the, the really controversial writings uh, that involve you know, Freudian analysis and Marxist analysis and so on. But there's so many fantastic scholars writing about Hindu philosophy. But unfortunately, Nyaya is not sexy. So people don't pay so much attention to that. But there's a lot of really good uh, writing uh, on Hindu philosophy. Uh, there is a new group that has been established at the American Academy of Religion on Hindu philosophy and uh, took some time, right, uh, to, to develop that. But that, that is going, it's going to be running for its second time um, this November, assuming we're not all socially isolating still in November. And uh, I missed the first one because I went to the AAR and the first thing I did was break my foot. So I ended oh, up yes, in the hospital. Yes, yes. <laughs> but yeah, the short answer to your question is, yeah, like really intensive and intentional dialogue coming from both the academy and the practitioner community. Because right now, I mean, you have, you have academics who don't want to get involved with practitioner initiatives because they're afraid that they might get labeled as part of of uh, you know, a Hindu national movement or something of that kind. And you have practitioners who are leery of anyone who is an academic uh, in, in this field. So that mutual suspicion, the only way to overcome that is to, to keep talking, have this kind of engagement. Yep. Very good, very good, thank you. Uh, we are opening up the floor for some questions. But, and the uh, first question I have is, I think it's from Suhag Sukla, right? Suhag, is, is that you? Can you share a little bit about weapon, weaponizing of the term Hindutva to malign academic and advocates and Hindu critic? You briefly touched upon that right just now. Hello? Hello? Oh, I thought, was Suha going to speak or? No, I, I just read the question for you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, I, sorry. I, I, I thought Suha herself was going to speak as well. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. I was a little, little, little mis okay. miscommunication. So, 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 yeah. So on the weaponization of Yeah. We, in fact, uh, have, uh, um, we had a, a panel about this at the AAR a couple of years ago uh, in Denver. And uh, uh, this is something that uh, is very uh, pervasive right now. Uh, that the term Hindutva, of course, Hindutva means Hinduness, but it's also a term for, I think, what I would broadly call conservative Hindu movements uh, and organizations, which are very diverse, actually. I mean, the, the aims of the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, for example, are different from the aims of the RSS. They're not the same organization, right? But they tend to be sort of lumped together uh, and uh, uh, connected with, the, of course, the BJP uh, in terms of uh, electoral politics. And there's been a tendency among some in the academy, not many, but they're very vocal, right, to 
identify any kind of positive assertion about or identification with Hindu dharma with this Hindutva movement, right, with the Sangh Parivar and so on. And the implica it's, it's, it's the classic uh, philosophical, logical error of guilt by association. Okay, you rode in the same train car with X and X murdered his wife, therefore you were complicit in the murder of X's wife, right? It, it's, it's sort of like that. Uh, but in fact, you might be, uh, you might have no involvement with that at all. Uh, and uh, also it, it disregards the fact that this Hindutva movement is very broad. Uh, just as you look at, uh, if you think of conservative politics in America, right? Uh, you have, uh, you know, people who are sort of moderate Republicans uh, who probably agree with Democrats on a lot of things. They're just a little more leery of government regulation. And then you have Alex Jones from InfoWars and, you know, the lizard people are taking over and, uh, you know, all of that. And then there's a whole lot in between, right? And in the same way, the Hindutva movement's very, very broad. So there are, there are groups that are sort of categorized and classed within what is this broad umbrella of Hindutva, some of whom I would want nothing to do with. I mean, there, there are groups that are genuinely involved in hate speech and, and just, you know, real nastiness. Now we can analyze why that is, and we can say, well, maybe there's a broader historical context for it, but on its own, it's, it's inexcusable, right? Uh, but then you have many, many more movements that, you know, they're just articulating a different vision um, often for India than uh, maybe one that fits with the political preferences of, of academic scholars in America. So uh, this, uh, yeah, it, it's a kind of uh, uh, sort of like a McCarthyism, uh, you know, the ideologies are reversed, but it's a similar kind of thing, guilt by association. I think a lot of this also goes with what, uh, I don't know if any of you follow Bill Maher, the comedian Bill Maher, but uh, what he often decries is the shaming culture. Uh, and Bill Maher is a really progressive guy. I mean, I, you know, I am too uh, on, on most issues, uh, but a lot of people on our end of the political spectrum, you know, if someone has any association at all with anything that they disagree with or disapprove of, oh, you can't, you know, you can't like that person anymore, right? You can't enjoy their comedy. You can't read their books. You can't listen to their music. I think this is why Kevin Hart got banned from uh, hosting the, uh, the Oscars. You know, there was this, you know, something he had posted a long time ago. People make mistakes and uh, people say things. And also sometimes people just disagree. And we, there needs to be a little more tolerance, I think, and openness uh, for that. And there's not a lot of that on any end of the political spectrum at the moment in India or America. So Hindutva has become this word that you basically use when you want to shut someone down or say, you know, you don't want to take them seriously. Oh, they're Hindutva, right? And it would be very difficult, I think, to categorize my perspective and what I do as Hindutva, as the term is commonly known. So someone coined the term soft Hindutva and accused me of that because they wanted to discredit, you know, what I do. So uh, I, I, I personally don't take it very seriously, but it can be really damaging for younger scholars because, I mean, I had a scholar not too long ago contact me and he was saying, you know, he, he's, you know, he's a practitioner, you know, so he's both an insider and a scholar. And he's very worried about getting, you know, sort of associated or tarred with this term of, of Hindutva because, Honestly, he's looking for jobs and uh, that will reduce the number of jobs available to him because there are places where, you know, this sort of Hindu phobic uh, attitude is very strong and they wouldn't even look at you if you applied for a job there. And there are other places where they say, oh, no, we want practitioner perspectives. Please, you know, join us. But a scholar just setting out in their career doesn't want to limit their options, you know, so it's, it's hard. And I basically all I told him was, uh, to just sort of express the same things like, yeah, I get it. You know. But there are people, unfortunately, that it's probably impossible to really engage with, right? If they're very, very hardened in their attitude, if they're equating all of Hindu dharma with a specific political movement that they don't agree with or that they object to, then that's guilt by association and it's, it's unfair and it's inaccurate. And, uh, you know, all we can do is argue against it, you know? Yeah, that reminds me of a paper by uh, uh, Vishwad Luri, Cry Hindutva, How Rhetoric Trumps Intellect in South Asian Study. That's also available on Academia it is. Uh, for and anybody's it, reference. And it cites, uh, it cites the, the 
attack against me that I just mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, but before we uh, proceed further, how much time do we have, Doctor Long? I'm, I'm, I'm socially isolated, so I'm I'm here. <laughs> I, I, okay. I'm here as long as you need. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go with um, some of the questions, and uh, I will turn over uh, the floor for a little bit to Ram and Lishan. They will uh, read some of the questions. Okay, I will uh, take the next question. I'm going to ask the next question. It's from George Anderson. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's from George Anderson. The question is, do you think that the contemporary politics, which is Kashmir, Islam, and the political discourse, are driving the anti-India and the anti-Hindu and Hinduism sentiments? Uh, yes, I think so, actually, because... Um, again, this goes back to that question of context. And if we're talking about anti-Hindu sentiments in America, again, most Americans have very little knowledge of Kashmir, India, the history behind all of that. And so if they just look at what's going on right now, they will say, oh, this is, this is a clearly oppressive situation where, you know, the, the Hindu government is, is, is oppressing the, the uh, Muslim community in Kashmir. But if you know more of the history and you know about what happened to the Kashmiri pundits and the fact that that really doesn't seem to be mentioned by much anyone except the Hindu American Foundation nowadays, uh, that uh, there's a broader context that has that is that completely changes the, the picture, right? Because uh, people will say, oh, there's, there's ethnic cleansing going on in Kashmir. And the response to that is, yeah, since the 1980s. Um, and you know, not just from one side, right? You, you had the, this uh, really humanitarian disaster. Uh, I think many would use the word genocide for what happened to the Kashmiri pundits without a similar kind of outrage or response in, in the Western world. And so, yeah, I, I think uh, it's the selective uh, looking at, at history that, that becomes problematic. Now, there are certainly things that can be criticized about what the uh, Indian government uh, is doing in Kashmir and, and in other places as well. Uh, but when it gets termed a Hindu issue, then again, you have this sort of blanket condemnation of, of the whole Hindu dharma happening. Uh, and uh, you know, the whole Hindu dharma is not identifiable with the policies of one government or one party anywhere. It's, it's vast and it's ancient and and all encompassing. So uh, I, I think that, yeah, the, the short answer to that question is yes. I mean, the, uh, uh, this um, uh, situation right now with, with Kashmir and with uh, several other things as well going on in India, uh, they contribute to the anti-Hindu sentiment because if they become the sole focus, like if, if all you know about India is those stories, then it looks very bad. But that's the problems. People in America lack context for understanding all of this. It's, it's like our Japanese friends thinking that we're all shooting each other all the time here in the US. Okay, yeah. okay, thank you. Uh, Nishant, can go Yeah, um, there are like, I think there are three or four questions. I think one from Sneha, one from Suhag as well. And uh, again, from George Anderson, uh, the question is, isn't Brahminical patriarchy just a way of scapegoating Brahmins? Uh, with Brahminism being uh, a euphemism for Hinduism. Right, right, right. This is a very interesting kind of question, and it's got a long kind of scholarly background to it, because uh, the term Brahmanism was first coined um, back in the 19th century, uh, maybe even earlier, but uh, there was an attempt to differentiate between the what we might today call the Hindu practices and beliefs of the time of the Buddha from later centuries and later periods. So from a sort of the, the kind of mainstream academic perspective of how Hindu traditions developed is you, you sort of start with the Vedas and the Vedic traditions and they're very prominent in the Northwestern part of the subcontinent. And then those sort of gradually spread and assimilate and absorb within themselves uh, the indigenous practices of the rest of the subcontinent. So then you get like Vaishnavism and Shaivism and so on uh, arising and becoming sort of very big parts of what emerges as Hindu Dharma. And so you have that kind of original core, which comes to be identified with the term Brahmanism. And it's usually used to identify the most conservative thread of Hindu tradition. So in philosophical terms, you'd say this is the Purva Mimansa 
uh, perspective, right? It's a Vedic ritualism. And this is the perspective from which the Dharma Shastras were also written. I saw a question in the chat about the Manusmriti, right? What do you think of the Manusmriti? See, Manusmriti is part of this very conservative uh, Dharma Shastra tradition. Now, uh, one of the things that a lot of scholars have begun debating uh, in the last few years is the extent to which the perspective on society reflected in those texts really reflects what was happening in India traditionally. Um, because you read a text like the Manusmriti, for example, and it will categorize all the different types of people and who should do what, and, and uh, you know, all of these things are sort of very systematically laid out. But there's reason to believe that a lot of that was sort of the ideal of the authors of those texts more than the practice of what people actually did on the ground. Right. So, uh, for example, we know from genetics now that people didn't start practicing endogamy in India, that is marrying within your own jati, right, until actually quite a bit later than those texts actually emerged. So those texts were there and then they eventually, that particular ideology and belief system came to be predominant. But uh, it was not always the case. So the term Brahmanism is often used to sort of describe that I would say that sort of conservative branch of the tradition. And I would say for that purpose, it's, it's not a bad term, but to the extent that one also wants to critique or distance oneself from that conservative perspective, it becomes a negative term. Oh, that's Brahmanism. And yes, that can then be used as a Hindu phobic you know, device, right? Oh, this is all Brahmanism, right? It's all, you know, it's, it's, it's the attempt again to reduce all of Hindu Dharma to caste and the, you know, the sort of hierarchy which Brahmins who authored texts over 2000 years ago envisioned as the ideal society. And of course, uh, we also have to look critically at what, what were those Brahmins envisioning? So for example, there are really old, like if we look at the Shruti, if we look at the Rig Veda, or if you look at the Upanishads, there's evidence that one's Varna was not necessarily determined by birth, that it would be a matter of character, a matter of disposition. Uh, one of my favorite stories along this line is from the Chandogya Upanishad, there's Satyakama, uh, the one who loves truth, right? And uh, he's the illegitimate son of a servant woman, right? Uh, and so uh, he wants to be a Brahmin, he wants to be a Vedic teacher. And he goes to his teacher or the, the person he wants to have as his teacher, and he's told to recite his lineage and he tells the truth, you know, I'm, I'm the son of Jabala and, you know, she doesn't know who my father is. And, and the teacher says, uh, well, who but a Brahmin would be so honest, right? And uh, there's, a, there's a whole chapter in the Dhammapada. This is another kind of aspect of the academic discourse that gets kind of distorted. Buddhism is presented as this massive anti-Brahmin, anti-caste movement. Um, there is a whole chapter of the Dharmapada, the words of the Buddha, called the Brahman. And the Brahman is described as the ideal human being, someone who has control of the senses, someone who is full of compassion and full of insight. Uh, and he's basically saying that, rather like the Chandogya Upanishad, that a Brahman is not someone whose parents were Brahmins. A Brahman is someone who has these particular personal qualities. So that discourse also existed and was quite prominent in India for a long time. And only gradually did Varna and Jati get collapsed into each other. Uh, and that happened sometime in the first millennium of the common era. And there's evidence that uh, it was also a, a reaction very often against uh, foreign invasions because people become more conservative. They sort of cling more to their traditions if they feel threatened. And I think of all the American flags that sprouted everywhere after 9-11, right? People were terrified. And so they, they put up something that made them feel proud of themselves and, and confident in themselves. And so these traditions became much more conservative and much more sort of rigid after India had been invaded. And, and then of course the British kind of finished it off by codifying these things into law in, in, the, in the British sense of law, like, you know, legal cases and, and so on. Uh, and when uh, Sir William Jones translated the Manusmriti, which he did for the purpose of using Hindu law to administer uh, India, because uh, the British had a philosophy that, you know, try to govern people by their own laws so that they don't revolt. Uh, 
which was very different from French colonialism, where they tried to turn everyone into Frenchmen. So uh, you know, the different colonizing powers had different philosophies. And what happened was I think a lot of the British class system, which has been very rigid for a long time, was projected onto the Indian reality. When, uh, if you read authors like Ronald Inden, uh, for example, uh, who I studied with back in Chicago in the 90s, he argued that, the, that traditionally the, the Jatis and Varnas were more like the trade guilds of Europe, right? They provided job security. You had expertise that was passed on in a family for generations. And uh, it was not this sort of oppressive thing that it uh, later became. So yeah, the term Brahmanism is kind of used to encompass all of that. And then, uh, you know, sort of by extension, yeah, I mean, it becomes a way of saying, and that's, that's Hinduism, right? That's sort of true Hinduism. Whereas you have all these bhakti movements saying that, you know, it doesn't matter. And that's where most people have been uh, for a lot of history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Long. Um, that kind of brings us uh, some of the things that recent studies have come out. And two scholars pop up, pop out in my mind is, uh, Prakash Shah from England. He has written a book uh, on caste uh, and basically, and then also uh, Dr. Vishwa Adluri who talks about Indologists and basically saying uh, some, of the, some of the misconceptions and ideas that uh, Western society had uh, primarily in terms of religion also, uh, they superimposed those ideas when they studies when they studied India or Hinduism. Right. So, yeah. Do, right. do, you, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I think that's very useful. I mean, I think it's been a very useful critique. And, um, you know, I, I know um, Dr. Adluri and, and Dr. Bagchi, I know their work uh, a little better than, than Dr. Shah, but uh, I would say uh, it's been a very useful critique. Uh, they, they themselves have also been critiqued a lot. Uh, there's been sort of a defensive reaction uh, especially in Europe, uh, to a lot of what they've written. And, and they're a little confrontational, I have to say, uh, sometimes. But, uh, you know, everyone has their own, you know, style uh, of proceeding. But the phenomenon they're describing, and again, this is what I was describing in my presentation, is ethnocentrism, right? People look through the lens of their culture and the issues that are issues in their culture, and they tend to project those onto whatever they're looking at. And I think to some extent, this is an epistemic inevitability, right? What categories are you going to use, but the ones you have, right? So uh, Protestant Christian scholars in 19th century Germany were going to look at the world through the lens of, of 19th century Protestantism. And uh, the discipline got built out of a lot of their presuppositions. But of course, the problem is that one needs to also stretch beyond one's categories to really understand another tradition and another culture and society. And there needs to be that sort of dialogue. And um, uh, Rita Sharma, a really excellent scholar, uh, has talked about um, a sort of uh, kind of a dialectical hermeneutics, she calls it. It's a very sophisticated term. Uh, the basic idea is that scholars ought to, yes, use their categories and, and, and do their analysis and make their claims, but also be open to critique from the other side, right? How would my work and my culture and my society be viewed by someone in that cultural matrix and, and in that perspective? And that kind of mutuality, and this is sort of, this is the perspective I was coming from earlier when I said, you know, the, the academics and the Hindu leaders need to get together and, and have a good dialogue. Uh, that, that understanding that none of us is omniscient, right? That we need our perspective complemented by that of the other. Uh, it's when arrogance comes in. It's when we think our perspective is the only true, you know, the scientific perspective. Then we uh, are more inclined to, I think, make false claims or make claims in an arrogant way that, uh, you know, doesn't allow for uh, dialogue or discourse. I think that's the kind of phenomenon that, uh, that these scholars are pointing out. We have time for one more question. There are a lot of questions in the chat uh, yes. that, I, that yeah. are really good. Uh, someone, George Anderson. You wanna, okay, you wanna George pick Anderson, I see said, uh, I just, I'm just gonna pick out ones that I think okay. are especially pertinent and that I can answer quickly and easily. Okay. Uh, do you think that political criticism of Hindutva is used to mask anti-Hindu sentiment? 
just to clarify, one can be critical of Hindutva without being anti-Hindu. Absolutely. I mean, I agree with this question. In fact, a lot of the critics of Hindutva in India are Hindus, right? So th there are Hindus who don't identify with that movement, uh, who say, you know, that movement is, is wrong in various ways. Um, but I think it can work the other way too. Yes, that um, one can, uh, if one is already, uh, if already, one already has a negative inclination toward Hinduism, then Hindutva becomes a very easy way to, you know, uh, you know, express that. Uh, that is, crit critiquing Hindutva is an easy way to express that. But yeah, I mean, I've, I've critiqued Hindutva, and I, I, I think uh, there are, there's a lot that uh, needs to be said uh, in that regard. Um, again, it's this kind of question of context. Uh, I find there are people whose only commentary on Hinduism is about Hindutva. And then I begin to be suspicious that, okay, they think that's all there is to it, or they want us to believe that's all there is to it. But if you do a critique of Hindutva and then you give this lovely paper on, you know, uh, the Raslila uh, and Bhakti, then, you know, no, you've got a balanced view, right? You, you're, you're looking at, at different perspectives and, and so on. So, and, and that, those cases are going to vary from individual to individual. And one thing I've been very careful not to do in, in the article in Prabuddha Bharata and also uh, today uh, has been not to name, you know, sort of try to name and shame particular scholars, because I think you'd have to almost be a psychoanalyst to see if, if someone is, you know, are they Hindu phobic or are they just replicating the discourse? And so, I really don't want to go uh, into that area, and and uh, um, or you know, again, paint all my fellow academics as you know, Hindu phobic because they're not. So. Let's see. Uh, any questions? You you all want me to. Look at the um, there is um, there's one from Vishal Nehra. I think we haven't uh, responded yet. Uh, with the rise of yoga as a global phenomenon, why are people still so negative about Hinduism? I, I notice in the academic circles they tend to emphasize Buddhism, Jainism, Shramana traditions, but not yes. not give due credit to to the the originator of all these practices. Right, right. No, and uh, I, I think uh, again, this has to do with that that Hindutva question. I think that as Hindus have become more assertive about, you know, look, you know, you can't just take what's positive and then disassociate that from Hindu tradition and leave Hindus with the cast cows and curry, right? Uh, that's what tends to, to seem to be happening, right? Uh, Buddhism especially is presented very positively in the Western world. Uh, of course, there's still people who don't like Buddhism. You know, if you're, a, if you're you know, like a Christian missionary, you're not going to like Buddhism. But um, the, the, because I think uh, the, the, there's been this assertiveness, uh, we're getting now kind of a pushback, right? That uh, uh, there's, a, I think there are academics who have a worry that uh, you know that somehow Hindus are going to take over the whole discourse, right? And of course, Hindus have exactly the opposite worry of being left out of the discourse. So this is one of those places where it would be great. It would be great to have a conference of academic scholars who've written on yoga, um, including those who've been sort of critical of, of, of Hindu perspectives and Hindu leaders and teachers and, and, and yoga teachers. Uh, where they would really talk with each other and engage with each other about these things. I think that that would really be uh, excellent. Um, I think there's another factor as well. Uh, I mentioned about scholars being nervous uh, sometimes about their job prospects and so on and not getting caught in the crossfire of these ideological wars. And it's very safe to write about Buddhism and Jainism. I know I write a lot about Jainism. It's very, meaning, uh, I'm not saying that in a totally cynical way, but uh, there's, it's not as politically charged. The Hindu discourse is very politically charged right now. Uh, and so people get nervous about it. It's like, okay, I want to write about the Yoga Sutra, but let me write about Jainism because that's, you know, no one's going to get angry with me. <laughs> yeah. So that also happens. Uh, there is an interesting uh, question from uh, Nimi Professor. Uh, her name is Nimi. Can Hindus turn around the discourse in so many universities around the world that are anti-India and anti-Hindu and plainly intellectually dishonest? Right, right. Well, it, it depends on the university. Like I said, uh, there are scholars doing really excellent work that uh, I think uh, reflects well on Hindu traditions and that, uh, you know, is 
critical in the proper sense of critical. Uh, and there is uh, this sort of, of Hindu phobia. I, I, I don't think the situation is so dire that everywhere you go, it's going to be anti-Hindu, it's going to be intellectually dishonest. I think there, there are certain centers that maybe have become especially prominent or powerful in the discourse where that might be the case. But I don't, I, I mean, and maybe I'm, I'm biased by my own experience because I, my experiences have been pretty good. I mean, I, I got sort of attacked that one time online, but otherwise uh, I've, I've not had any, you know, great difficulties. And, and I find other scholars who share my views of not having any, you know, uh, major problems. So I think uh, what we need to do is, is I mean, if, if the person who asked the question is interested in studying uh, in one of these institutions, they need to just, uh, you know, look at the work of the people who are, who are there and say, okay, is this gonna be a friendly environment for a practitioner or is this gonna be a hostile environment? Um, it also depends on you. Like I deliberately chose to go to a university where I knew there was a lot of criticism of Hinduism because I wanted to have the experience of learning how to debate and argue and uh, address issues. So I, I went in knowing fully well, you know, what, what I was going to experience. And, uh, and it's not that it was a terrible experience, but it was, it was hard. I mean, uh, University of Chicago prides itself on being an intellectual boot camp, right? And uh, it really is. And uh, so um, the, it, it, if, if you want to engage in this, uh, you know, as, as the tradition talks about a purva paksha, right? Uh, one good thing to do would be maybe to just engage directly with, uh, with scholars, uh, you know, go through the process of becoming one and, uh, you know, take up these issues. Uh, at the same time, I, I know anecdotally from friends of mine that there are institutions where it's very hard to do that, right? Where like the hostility is, is outright hostility. And in those cases, I, I I think it's it's a much harder. Uh, I mean, I'm maybe I, I don't know if I'm answering the question adequately, except just reiterating that it is a very difficult path we have, right, to uh, sort of turn around the discourse uh, and uh, make it more equitable and, and more, uh, you know, friendly to practitioner perspectives. Again, not giving up the critical outlook. I mean, the academy has to be critical, or it's not the academy anymore. But critical, like I said, in the in the constructive sense, not in the, you know, well, we're just going to demolish this tradition kind of sense. Uh, um, and, and, and I, I think that, yeah, it, it's, the short answer is it's complicated. <laughs> Were you in the University of Chicago in the mid nineties? Were you there? Yes. I was there from 91 to 2000. For okay. two years in the middle, I was in India in JNU, which is another institution that, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of people talk about, you know, uh, the kind of politics of it and so on. So yeah, I, 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 I'm a product of both of those. And uh, I think I came out okay. Uh, <laughs> I used to look for an organization associated with University of Chicago. I was in the same campus actually for, I think it was in the mid 90s. Oh. So I was there for a year, year and a half. I'm not, I'm not an academic actually. So I was okay. looking for a social Where? survey organization. Actually. Oh. When were you in JNU, Dr. Long? 94, 95. Oh. I was there in 90 to 1994, and in 94, I came to U of I, so. <laughs> ah, okay, so we might have overlapped a little Overlap, bit. Overlapped, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I took Sanskrit courses in the Center for right. Historical Studies. The, the Sanskrit yes. school didn't exist yet in those days. Right, right. And right. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I had an ulterior motive. I wanted to study India. I wanted to study Sanskrit, but I also wanted mm -hmm. to, I had met uh, my wife uh, here, or rather in America, in, in Chicago, and she was teaching Japanese in JNU. Oh, okay. at the time. So uh, I went there to study, but I also went there to marry my fiance. Yeah. And uh, we just had our 25th anniversary on Thursday. Yeah. So, so we, uh, may have, we may have crossed, our, your wife and I may have crossed. I was in the School, school of Languages, Center of oh. Linguistic and, Linguistics and English. She did her PhD in that center Yeah, uh, with Professor Gill. Okay. Harjit Singh Gill? Yes. H.S. Gill. Probably. Yeah. yeah, he was a, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, I learned a lot from uh, Professor Kapil Kapoor and a whole bunch of other people, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've, I've heard him speak at a dip, number of different conferences, yeah. yeah. He was a vice chancellor, I think, for some Yes, pro-VC. Pro-VC, yeah. Yes, but he was very instrumental in setting up the Center for Sanskrit Studies, which also now become Indic Studies as well. 
Yes, school of the moon. Um, okay. Uh, one, I think one last question, um, uh, and then we can wrap up. Uh, the last question I think is from somebody called Nishu. Says, is Ramayana and Mahabharat against women? Um, uh, talk about these uh, narratives that Hindu epics are into. Personally, I don't believe in this, but I would be happy to know Dr. Long's view on, on, on this. Right. Well, the Ramayana and Mahabharata are so enormous, right? I, and, and they're so profound and they're, they're so complex. I don't think it's easy to categorize them in a really simple way, like say pro-women or anti-women. Uh, there are episodes in both that you could find very problematic from a feminist perspective uh, or really just from a human perspective, right? I, I don't think anyone likes the story of Sita being tested. Um, uh, Tulsi Das uh, in the Ramcharit Manas was so upset by it, he said it didn't really happen. <laughs> you know, that this, this, was a, this was an apparition of Sita, right, that went through that. So that's a critique coming from within the tradition itself. Uh, at the same time, you have very strong characters like Draupadi uh, in the Mahabharata, who is... Uh, a real uh, sort of driver of the story uh, in many respects. And so, I mean, so you, have, you have characters who, uh, women characters who suffer a lot. And uh, um, some have argued that Sita especially becomes kind of a negative role model because she suffers so much without complaining that this is seen to create a model where women kind of accept abuse and, and this sort of thing. Uh, and that's certainly a, a possible way of interpreting it. On the other hand, you could see Sita as sort of a universal figure that we can all identify with because we all suffer in various ways and at various times, and she's strong through all of it, right? So there are many ways of interpreting the stories. Uh, again, Draupadi, too, uh, a very strong figure. You have a lot of other uh, women figures uh, who are quite strong. Um, I think one of my favorite uh, strong women uh, in the Hindu text is actually not from Ramayana or Mahabharata, but from the Upanishads, uh, Gargi, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Who challenged Yagyavalkya to a debate, right? Which suggests that there was a time when women attended and participated in those kinds of debates. Uh, uh, I think the associations of, of Hinduism with, you know, patriarchy and, and women being sort of kept in a secondary role, I think there was a phase of that in Indian history, and you can see evidence for it, and uh, and you can still see it uh, in many respects today, but it's sort of grafted onto this much older tradition that was more, I think, egalitarianism uh, or egalitarian. Uh, Nila Bharacharya Saxena writes about this. She calls it the gynocentric matrix of Hindu traditions and that, that uh, her hypothesis is that this was really originally a goddess-centered tradition. And some of the oldest images we have from, for example, uh, Indus civilization and, and before are goddess images. And, you know, it's Shakti that is worshipped. And so uh, the later kind of rise of a kind of more patriarchal uh, tradition overlaid on top of that uh, never really completely, I would say, penetrated to the core of the tradition, you could say. And uh, that's why it's possible now you such a, see such a resurgence today of of women's roles and women's leadership. And of course, I'm thinking of Suhag there because I see her in, in the, in one, on my screen, you know, right. and the HAF has the Shakti initiative uh, and so forth. Right. And, uh, and of course, this is another thing too about you know, some of the criticisms of, of, uh, of the Hindu Dharma that we get, you know, it's, it's oppressive, it's patriarchal, it's anti, you know, Muslim, anti-Christian and so on. Uh, to, Basically, correct those things within the tradition is another way to address these criticisms. Right? If someone's Hindu phobic, they're always going to find something to criticize. But to be as above criticism as possible in the way we live and present ourselves is, I think, a, also extremely important part of uh, this whole process. Yeah, that reminds me of a, a, an article by Dr. Lavanya Bensani that appeared on our one of our platforms, Indic Today, and I think it's also available on. Uh, Academia, Sita, the nature in its feminine form. Yes. So that's a very good paper if anybody wants to uh, read it. It's a very profound interpretation of Sita in that paper. Yeah. So Professor, okay. uh, when okay. you're here in Chicago next time, we should trek up to University of Chicago campus. We have some sure. good, uh, good food near the, uh, near the area in the neighborhood. Oh, yeah. Some of those restaurants that are actually on the 55th. Oh, yeah. Back when I was there, uh, it's funny, the best Indian food in Hyde Park was at a place called Rajan Cajun. 
<laughs> yes, uh, the Indian there was, I think, either from Uganda or Kenya. Yes. Right? He was and the one. Just, uh, from the title of the restaurant, you wouldn't expect it. But people who had lived there said, that's where you go. And of course, there's Devon Street, but that's the other whole end of town. Yeah, so. $4.99 for a, for a buffet back then. I remember yes. it. <laughs> yes. Those were the days. Right? Yes. Yeah. With well, the economy going like it is, it might be that way again. You never know. Yeah. That's well, true. that's another wonderful session. Uh, Dr. Long, thanks for coming up to our uh, program here. And uh, we'll be continuing with this next week. Uh, it, actually, Nishant Bhai will be presenting his reading. Can you uh, quickly mention that to us? Yeah, I'll be uh, uh, reading up two of the, it's, it's a part of a book reading session. So I'll be uh, reading up two books uh, from the India They Saw series. Uh, the first one is from Sandhya Jayanji and the second one is from Meenakshi Jayanji. So I'll try to cover the both the books and uh, kind of give a high overview, kind of book review of uh, both of those. So hope some of you uh, are able to join us. And thank you, Dr. Long, for being here. I also would like to thank uh, Hari Kiranji and the India team for uh, giving us this uh, opportunity to host this webinar and uh, thank you Ram and Nishan helping me here today. So next, until next time, uh, namaste. Namaste. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.